Time to continue our look around the NFC West with an in-depth look at a Seahawks division opponent by someone who covers the team, Walter Mitchell. He writes, he podcasts, he's been following the Cardinals for many, many years. We're going to talk a little bit about his very interesting history. He also has some great things to say about his views of what he thinks of the Seattle Seahawks from where he sits. Part two of a three-part series examining division opponents for the Seahawks coming up next today on Seahawks Forever with the Arizona Cardinals offseason recap. Welcome to the Seahawks Forever podcast. In-depth analysis on everything Seahawks. And now, here's your host, Dan Viennes. Walter Mitchell writes about the Cardinals for the Revenge of the Birds website. The podcast is the Red Rain podcast. He's been a Cardinals fan his entire life, despite the fact he's not from Arizona. In fact, he's from a very surprising area of the country where there's another team that's done quite well over the years. We'll get into that. Before we do that, hit that like button, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell for notification of future episodes, subscribe on any audio platform, if that is your preference, wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to hear episodes without ads, you can do that on Spotify. Right now, it's less than a dollar a month. You can sign up. The description or the link will be in the description. Other ways you can support the podcast, a super thanks. You can buy me a coffee or you can just leave a review on Apple Podcasts, a five-star review. If you really like what I do, you can actually write comments there as well. You can't do that on Spotify, but you can leave a rating and that helps placement and the growth of the channel as well. Let's get into this. Walter Mitchell joining me earlier today to recap the entire offseason for the Cardinals, where he thinks the roster stands, his thoughts on Kyler Murray and the organization hitching their wagon to him, some improvements he's, he thinks they've made, a 12-player draft class, some interesting free agent signings. We're going to talk about some ex-Seahawks, some other players on that roster that have ties to the area as well. Really, really cool conversation. Here it is, Walter Mitchell joining me today. Welcome to the show, Walter. We're going to talk some Arizona Cardinals today on this Seahawks show. It's good to have you. And um, before I hit record, we were talking a little bit about your background. And I'm fascinated by this because you're a Cardinals fan, have been your entire life. And now you cover the Cardinals, podcast about the Cardinals, talk about them on a daily basis. But yet... You're from the backyard of the seven-time world champion New England Patriots. How did that happen? Wow. Well, my uncle had season tickets to the New York Giants. Um, and in 1963, he invited me to my first pro football game, uh, NFL game. And it was at Yankee Stadium, Cardinals, Giants. And, uh, you know, as a eight-year-old kid, I walked down the ramp and saw the field and the Cardinals just happened to be practicing on the field. The Giants hadn't come out of the tunnel yet. And there was this free safety number eight, Larry Wilson, making these acrobatic plays all over the field. And I was like, God, that guy's amazing. And I turned to my uncle and said, I kind of like this Cardinals group. Do you mind? He goes, no, I'll even buy you a pennant. And um, <laughs> that's how it starts, which he did. And you're, after that, it became a tradition. He invited me a number of the games. And that was back when the Cardinals were in the NFC East. Mm -hmm. So were the Cowboys. <clears throat> and um, well, had a lot of good uh, back and forth. Of course, the Giants have since won two Super Bowls. And the Cardinals appeared in one. And with two minutes and 43 seconds left, had a lead. Yeah, felt pretty good about that. It was close. So, um but uh, it's been a lot of hard times since, a lot of hard times playing your Seahawks, although we sort of had your number there. Yeah, Bruce Arians uh, figured out a way, <laughs> for, especially up here at, at our place. Uh, that, was, that was a tough stretch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, remember Drew Stanton? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. I got, you know, Andre Ellington touchdown. Um, that was that's a that's a meme for cardinal fans they go back to all the time but uh but i mean in recent years you've had our number and um i like your team and i'm anxious to get um talking about it and uh, 
Uh, yeah, I'd love to get your thoughts on kind of from an outside perspective, a, a rival's perspective on the Seahawks. We'll get into that a little bit later. I, I One of the few Seahawks road games I've ever attended, it was actually in Arizona. I want to see if I can get the year right. It was 20... 16 17 it was the 3 3 overtime tie um oddly oh, enough gosh. Where, where both oh, kickers oh. missed sub 30 oh, yard man. kicks <laughs> that would have won it and it, it it was it was maybe the strangest football experience i've ever had in person because we all just yeah. we we were all walking out of the stadium that day cardinals fans and seahawks wow. fans of which there was a really large contingent of uh, of 12s there and we're all just kind of it was just dead silent we're all just looking at each other like what do we do? Like we, <laughs> nobody could talk smack. There was nothing to celebrate. It was it was strange. We all just kind of went to lunch after oh, that. Like it was just it was weird. Very very bizarre. Well, you've mentioned the ups and downs. Just three years removed from an eleven year season, and then back to back four and thirteens. Lots yeah. of changes. Uh, an off season ago, new general manager Monty Austin Fort, new head coach Jonathan Gannon. There were some some bright spots last year. There were some times they played well. And then heading into the second off season, are you starting to get a feel for the plan and just kind of the overall idea of what they're trying to build there? Yeah. Um, the offensive plan, as you guys saw in week 18, um, seems to be moving along. Well, it's a different plan for Kyler Murray than he's ever played in. We're basically a 12 and 13 personnel with a pretty good young tight end in Trey McBride um, and another up and coming tight end in um, Elijah Higgins. So we run a lot of two and three tight end sets um, and we run the ball a lot like you guys try to do um, with James Conner. Now we picked up Trey Benson in the draft. So we got a one, two punch there. Um, it's more tight end centric than it's ever been. Of course, Monty, Grew up in the Patriots organization, and um, I imagine that was a bit of an influence. And I'm really intrigued with that. Uh, Kyler seemed to take to it towards the end in those last two games, winning at Philly and almost having the win against you guys in week 18. Um, so that's encouraging. And Kyler is much more invested now in, in the program, and um, that's bearing some fruits for him. And as a leader, he's starting to emerge. And it's taken a while, but if uh, if this continues in that direction and he proves he can handle what so far to me doesn't look like a quarterback friendly system, as a in terms of passing the ball, right? Um, although Marvin Harrison Jr. might have something to say about yeah, that. He, he, I'm, I'm yeah. sure Kyler was happy with that pick. Oh, uh, he really was, and uh, so. But things personnel-wise, I think we haven't been able to draft or uh, sign any superstars, nor was I think uh, that was uh, in the budget to do because of Kyler's contract. Um, but we've signed a bunch of mid-range guys that could be hungry, um, could be, make a difference. Like two, we picked up two tackles now to try to stop Kenneth Walker. <laughs> he was had field days against us, and so has uh, yeah. Kyron Williams. Oh God! And of yeah, course, yeah. You, we, got, we got us too. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I mean, if you're going to defend in that division, and that's my big question mark is whether we can defend in the division. Right. Right. I mean, um, last year we were 32nd in DVOA on defense. Um, we didn't have. We had one sack in the last six games. Um, and that was a chase out of bounds sack hmm. um, against Justin Fields by Dennis Gardeck. So, but we picking up defensive pieces. The draft was defensive oriented past the first pick. And you know, we'll see what Gannon and Nick Rallis, 31 years old, who are defensive coordinators, who's a really bright guy, can do to somehow um, compete in the NFC West. Yeah, I think you nailed it. I had the same feelings as I was kind of going back over and 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 uh, revisiting the moves in the offseason. Uh, solid, if unspectacular, free agent signings, but ones that really address major needs. You, you pick up the two defensive tackles, as you mentioned, Justin Jones, Bilal Nichols. 
You add a starting offensive tackle in Jonah Williams, who never really quite achieved star status. It was sort of expected from him uh, earlier in his career. A starting corner in Sean Murphy Bunting, uh, some linebacker depth in Mac Wilson. And then, you know, you guys love your ex Seahawks down there. You even go add Evan Brown for depth at center and guard. You add DJ Dallas to the running back room. Yep. In addition to, uh, you know, last year, LJ Collier, Joey Blunt, Tyreek Smith. Got to give a shout out to those ex Seahawks there. Exactly. Yeah. It's, uh, but, but I like those pieces because you needed, you, you know, there was, there was, you needed help. And, and I think sometimes what I see when, when teams try to rebuild is they get a little antsy. And especially if they have any cap space available or they make it available or they get creative with how they structure contracts and they try to make splashy moves. It seems like that is not the MO here yeah. so far for the Cardinals anyway. And the, certainly looking at the depth chart this year looks a lot more balanced than it did a year ago. And then, yes. you, add, and then you add 12 draft picks. I mean, this is a draft class that I, I bet from afar, John Schneider really admires what Monty Ossenvort's been doing because Schneider was known, until the last couple of years anyway, a, as a guy that loved to trade around in the draft, add draft capital, get extra picks. We saw a lot of that last year. Uh, you know, Everybody saw the, the war room video of Ossenvort trying to maneuver around last year at the top of the draft. Very, very impressive how he was working that. And then this year, they just stick at number four, and I'm sure they fielded a bunch of calls from quarterback needy teams. But when the best player in the draft on most big boards, who's not a quarterback, is sitting there at number four in Marvin Harrison Jr., you take him. Was there any question leading up to the draft that they might go a different direction there? I think it all hinged on this number three pick um, when uh, the Patriots decided to take uh, um, Drake May. Because if May slid to four, Dan, I think the phones would have been rigging off the hook. Yeah. And then one of those offers might have been too good to refuse. Um, and I think that was the only scenario in which, because we learned later that J.J. McCarthy wasn't as um, highly sought after as yeah. May. Um, and uh, the Vikings weren't going to come up to four with a huge package to get J.J. Um, and they played it just perfectly from their end. So. Yeah, I, I think that was the only wild card that could have happened, and because I think that Marvin Harris Jr. Harrison Jr. Has sat at the top of the Cardinals draft board for two years now, so they knew um, if they were going to make the pick, they were going to take him. Um, as you said, they they focus on defense after that. Uh, the guy that I'm intrigued by is Darius Robinson, your second first round yeah. pick at 27 overall, because he was a guy that especially. You know, there was a lot of thought that maybe, depending on how the draft fell, of course, Seattle might try to move down from 16, get back into the 20s and pick up some extra draft capital. And if they had done that, uh, there were a lot of dots that you could have connected that Darius Robinson seemed like a guy that would be higher on their board. As I studied him, I kind of had a hard time with that evaluation because he's he's everything you want in a player character-wise, uh, the height, the length, the athletic ability – um, but not a lot of twitch, not a lot of flash, not a dynamic player. Uh, what were your initial thoughts about that pick and, and kind of what you've learned about him since? Well, <clears throat> our best years running the 34 defense, which over the years of my bone of contention has been drafting 34 prototypes, which we don't seem to do. We keep just inserting guys at linebacker positions that have – just aren't suited for it, although they're good athletes like Isaiah Simmons um, and Hassan Reddick. Uh, but um, for us, Darius Robinson made a lot of sense because when we've been at our best in the 34, we've had a stud at 34 D end in Calais Campbell, uh, Darnell Dockett, and then JJ Watt. And Zach Allen wasn't too shabby either, who's now in, in, um, in Denver. So yeah, a guy that Seahawks tried hard to sign in free agency. Yeah. And when you get a versatile kid like, like Darius Robinson, who is tenacious for the run and then also can rush to, from the interior, which I think they want him to do occasionally kick out to the edge, but I think they want him to provide that inside pass rush at six, five and with his length um, and his ability um, 
to push people around and swim, I think it's a great pick. I mean, we were all hoping for Jerzon Newton um, from yeah. Illinois, but then word came out that what was I think both his feet were fractured. Yeah, yeah, he had that surgery on the other one now. Uh, yeah. Right, and that's the reason why he slipped. I think he would have been ahead. And I think the other guy who they were probably targeting was uh, Chop Robinson, hmm. um, who I thought went higher than he, than, than um, I thought he would go. I think he went to like a twenty-one or something like that. And um, so, but Darius made sense from that standpoint of big guy from the interior who can, I think, hopefully be our next Calais Campbell. Let me put the rest of these picks up here. I got a, a graphic here on the screen. Uh, you mentioned Trey Benson, who some people felt like in a year where there, there really wasn't an elite blue chip first round type running back, right. some people feel might be the best back in the draft. Max Melton, excellent cover corner out of Rutgers. Is there another guy on this list, maybe a little farther down, that that's kind of become a favorite of yours? Maybe a little bit of a, a dark horse out of this group? Well, I'm a Boston College alum. <clears throat> Excuse me, Dan. Um, so Elijah Jones had a great year for us, uh, five interceptions. He really came on in the in the um, pre-draft process. Um, he His measurables of 4-3 and 42-inch vertical caught a lot of people's attention. I was kind of surprised he was still there at the end of the third round. So he, he stands out for me. And then the rabbit, Dadrian Taylor Demerson. We need a rangy free safety who can also kick down into the slot. And I think he's perfect for what we need. I mean, our safeties are really good in the box, Buddha and yeah. uh, and J and um, TJ, uh, uh, JT Thompson. Um, yeah. But they're not rangy center fielders who cover over the top. So adding a versatile kid like that may help us defend Tyler Lockett who beat us <laughs> over the top to lose game, you know, week in week 18. Yeah. Whether that was staged or not is another conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but we've seen it too yeah. often when it wasn't staged. Yeah. I mean, Walker has crushed us year after year. I've been begging the Cardinals for years to draft a guy who could cover them. And now maybe, damn, we might have a couple. Well, that's what really stands out to me when you put sort of the aggregate together of of the last couple off seasons is, you know, that secondary was was a real weak spot not too long ago, and now you start to look at look guys stack up on each other, and it's always interesting from here to look at your safety group that you've already talked about because we have a UW Husky and we have a WSU Coug, where I'm an alumni from, right. uh, of Thompson and Baker playing together, which is such an interesting combo. Last year, Garrett Williams in the draft coming off the knee injury. So maybe this will be the first year that he's really, you know, fully right. 100%. Yeah, and Melton to that group. Right. Uh, and then Sean Murphy bunting in, in free agency. Suddenly that secondary starts to look like a strength. Yeah. And it wouldn't surprise me if when everything shakes out, Murphy bunting's like quarterback three. Mm -hmm. um, because I think. Max Melton's versatility, I was just thrilled with him. Um, I thought he was one of the big sleepers in the draft, but the, the cornerback group was so deep. And, you know, I've had Seahawk envy, secondary envy for years now. <laughs> I mean, Reek, I mean, Reek is awesome. Yeah. You've got Weatherspoon now. That dude, <laughs> he, he hit his grandmother on the way to the buffet line. Yeah, it makes sense to me if Larry Wilson's the guy that made you a Cardinal fan that you would like Witherspoon because oh, uh, two God. guys, two guys that love to be physical for sure. Yeah, and your Legion of Boom was unbelievable. It was so good, and everyone was the perfect prototype. I mean, it seemed like a reach with Chancellor, except no, it wasn't. That's right. that strong. <laughs> he was a monster, and mm. uh, you know the whole all four of them were like perfect prototypes for what you wanted to do. And by the way, I'll sneak this in. I've always been a Pete Carroll fan. Sorry, Cardinals fans. But he was a head coach of the Patriots here for a while. And then sure. I saw him live in clinics. I'd say next to Belichick might be the best defensive back coach that I've ever known. Um, I mean, I mean, he 
knows what he's doing there. And I also love the way, Dan, that he'd bring in um, safety guys to teach tackling. Um, who was that, the Asian coach they had a while back? I mean, I thought that was such a classy thing. So they were doing it the right way and make, trying to make sure that, the, that how they were tackling was yeah. safe and productive. Yeah, so uh, hats off to your secondary. With with that in mind, with with what you just said, what was your reaction from afar uh, in, in the Seahawks moving on from Carroll, especially after he finished last season with the walk off win against your Cardinals? You know, right. seemingly finishing on a strong note. Well, I had mixed emotions because uh, you know I wanted to get him back. I mean, he took out our teams, man. The yeah. best year we had with Arians. I don't know if you remember this, but we're like 13 and and two. And it's last week of the season, and the Seahawks are coming in. And with virtually nothing to gain, except Carroll wanted to kick our ass. <laughs> and he not only kicked our ass, he injured Carson Palmer's hand more than it was. And we went limping into the playoffs. I mean, they like whooped us like 33 to nine or something um, with and that point. It's like a perfect game to rest people or and then you did it again two years ago with Russell Wilson's swan song coming into Arizona. We were playing for the NFC West. We win that game. We win the NFC West. Mm, yeah. And Wilson has an epic day. Lockett goes off as usual. And we lose, uh, you know, I mean, scored like, there were like 12, 20 plus yard pass plays from Wilson in that game. I mean, that's why I want a secondary thing. I mean, it was just awful. And, you know, we had everything to gain and they did, you didn't, you weren't even going to the playoffs. Right. Yeah. That's, that's, to me, that's an that's interesting history. About Pete Carroll. Yeah. That says a lot about not only Pete Carroll's ability to coach, but to gain a competitive advantage is if you're playing in your division, you show up no matter what the circumstances are and you get after it. Yeah. So much interesting history between those two teams. You know, Russell Wilson's first start in the NFL was at Arizona, came up just short on a, on a last minute drive. And, right. uh, you know, so many big, you know, Beast Quake 2, <laughs> the sequel. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Happened down there. And even during those Arians years where he figured out how to come up here and beat the Seahawks, you know, we would often get them down there. And then we had the weird tie game. We had, you know, and then obviously the, the worst moment in Seahawks history happened on that field, although not against the Cardinals, of course. So uh, a, lo a lot going on there for sure. Um, and we'll talk about the division kind of as a whole to wrap things up, but I want to get a little bit more into Kyler Murray and you've touched on it. it oddly enough, because it seems like forever ago that he signed this thing, but you know, literally this is year one of that five-year contract extension. He's just starting it now right. coming off, you know, coming off a year in which he missed the first half of the year because of the ACL the previous year. So he starts eight games last year. Um, you know, that, that, that extension was signed by the previous administration. There was some question about how the organization felt about him, some some whispers about leadership, but then yet the next, the last two years, two pretty epic quarterback classes at the top of the draft, they've decided to stay away from that and really hitch their wagon and commit themselves to Kyler Murray. You mentioned that he's had to change his play style a little bit to fit this scheme. It's been a very quiet offseason. We haven't heard anything about Kyler Murray. So he seems content. Is this, I mean, all their eggs are in his basket now. Yeah. Is this is this going to work? Are you a Kyler Murray guy? I was. I was the first guy touting for the Cardinals to uh, trade Rosen and take Kyler because I just saw Kyler had superior skills in all, in all ways except height. Um, and I thought that, Kyler of the way he played at Oklahoma used his his smaller stature to his advantage and um and I thought he could do that in the NFL hmm. what concerns me about Kyler now is that you know the you guys helped start Pete Carroll helped start how to defend Kyler Murray you put him in a box 
and you contain rush and you rush hard up the middle and you relegate him to the pocket if you can do that my issue with kyler is he doesn't float he tends to stay on one spot and the best ones like look at brock purdy he puts on a floating clinic every week that's why he's so good i mean he's not that tall either but even taller nfl quarterbacks like tom brady had to float to like find a passing lane window Mm -hmm. that's clear um and to wait that get that extra second while someone's coming open right yeah so if kyler doesn't learn to float I'm not sure how successful he can be in the NFL as a passer. Hmm. I mean, he's got the great arm. He's very accurate. But at his his height, and here's the other thing I think we need from Kyler is he needs to run more up the middle. Uh, you guys took the romance out of that in one game a couple of years back where he was running up the middle and got sort of longest yard clotheslined by one of your, your linemen, and he suffered a bit of a soldier, shoulder tweak. Yeah. Um, but keeping teams honest up the middle is for him is huge. Otherwise you're just going to send the kitchen sink all the time up the middle. And, and Tyler, when, once he feels pressure, he's going to, you know, either kind of take a knee or try to scramble out from the back. And, um, you know, so it's kind of that maturation, no matter what system he's in, but man, when the guy is focused, Dan, yeah. when the guy wants it, there's a reason why he's 2-0 and against Dallas. I mean, that's a checkmark game, and both times in a stadium where he is a legend. I mean, when a game's on the line and he wants it, he can will it. Um, we saw that in his first game back against the Falcons when he gener- you know, like scrambled for 60 yards to set up a game-winning um touchdown uh you know he's just got that switch the 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 question though is can it become a consistent switch and you know it's it's a matter of consistency the buy-in is there now we haven't heard from kyler because he's in the building like jj watt was Hmm. and you know which by the way no one's done more to change the cardinals culture last three years than jj watt I mean, in a way, he was like the uber mensch who made everyone else except Buddha dim in comparison. Um, and I think it was really hard living up to him for the other guys. They were sort of like, man, why don't I, you know, train like this? Why don't why am I not in the building every day? Yeah. Yeah. He was Tyler is now. Yeah. And um, I think JJ set a really good example for people and the fact that he's dialed in and the fact that he's committed, it's going to be fascinating to see what he can do this year and, um, you know, see if he can take his game to that next level. Because even last year, Dan, he was good leading the team. Last four four games, they led the NFL in the yards per game at 404. <coughs> excuse me, or 414. But his passing efficiency, I mean, at QBR in the 40s, so that's got to change, um, and I think with you know an off season all on the field, all on the field for the first time since his rookie year. Yeah, because of COVID twice and this holdout, and then the year that uh, yeah, so he missed three in a row, and then last year with the rehab. So amazingly, here's Kyler in year six, with only one year of off season work on the field. Wow. So. Yeah, and maybe that will help that consistency uh, aspect of his game because that's the thing, you know, from from my vantage point that has frustrated me in watching him. The talent is real. Like, he's he's very Aaron Rodgers-esque in the way he can just flick his wrist and the ball's 40 yards downfield right on the money. And and, and as an opponent, that's kind of scary. But then you'll see you'll see a drive or two where they go three and out and he just – it's third and six and he air mails it over a guy's head and he walks off the field with that blank expression on his face right. and wondering, you know, what's going on with him. But right. if you can put it all together, he's – he, he can certainly be a weapon. It's They make an interesting move in the offseason, too. They draft Clayton Toon last year. He gets right. some opportunities during Kyler's absence. 
And then they go out and they make the move in trading for Desmond Ritter right. this offseason. Is, is that a statement on how they feel about Tune, perhaps? Or is that a way of maybe putting a little bit of heat on Kyler as a guy that's still young, has some upside, and, and some feel can still at some point be a starter in this league? Yeah, that's a great question. I think a lot of Cardinals fans are confused about that move. Um, what it made sense for me is what that move said to me is we don't want to use one of our draft picks on a, another quarterback. So let's bring in an experienced guy. We can get him for cheap, just a player for player trade, which is rare today in the NFL. Cause we gave up Rondale Moore, who was yeah. never really got, you know, um, in the flow with, for us, but, but, you know, Ritter, if you go back and watch this Notre Dame game, the year they were undefeated at Cincinnati, I, I became a total fan right then. Um, he was up and down, but at uh, in Atlanta, but he was like eight and nine with Atlanta. I think that's pretty good, actually. Um, and um, he's got some attributes, but there's no mistake. Kyler Murray on the talent level is superior. Sure. Um, but in this offense with Drew Petzing as coordinator, we need a game manager who can be a run first guy. Um, and that takes a special skill. I know Kurt Warner always said, don't give me the run first. I want to pass, 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 pass. I want to get in the rhythm. Then we'll run the ball because mm -hmm. now everyone's backed off. Um, Kurt would not want to play in this kind of offense because it's so run heavy. And then oftentimes you go run, run, and now it's third and four and you're, right. yeah. you're throwing yeah. the ball. We know that well. <laughs> <laughs> Just as you described it with Kyler at times, I started calling it the third and give up offense because it was just ridiculous. We'd throw, it'd be third and six. We throw three yard drag passes where he gets tackled on the catch. So now it's fourth and three. Or, like you said, sail the ball out of bounds on a fade route off of a three-step drop and no, throwing it nowhere near anybody. And, you know, it's like third and give up. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's that's where I think it makes sense. And I like Clayton Toon, too. I thought he got screwed being a sacrificial lamb against the Cleveland Browns yeah. when they wouldn't start Kyler. And... You know, fans still now think he sucks. I got to tell you what, <laughs> that Browns defense was just so in his face. I don't think it's fair in week nine or wherever it was, week 10, for a rookie to go in under those circumstances and evaluate him properly. So I think he's still got some some upside. Yeah, don't get me started about how quickly fans give up on a quarterback, a young quarterback, because he has a bad game or two. It's 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 interesting. The move to get Ritter fascinates me because the Seahawks did something very similar here. Right. They made the move for Sam Howell with just kind of a late round day three pick right. swap when they already have an established starter. I I wonder if if it's you know fans tend to overread some of these things. Maybe they got a guy that could be the the starter at some point. I just wonder if it's a financial thing because teams are a so quick to give up on young quarterbacks now that they're available, right? And b veteran backup quarterbacks are expensive. You know the Seahawks year in year out paid Geno Smith four or five million dollars to be their backup. You know Drew Locke went to New York and got he can earn up to eight depending on playing time. Like those guys cost a lot of money. There's a reason. There's a reason Ryan Tannehill hasn't signed with anyone yet because he's he's. He's holding out for more. And and yet you can go trade for a guy in year three who's maybe been a disappointment and he comes to you with like a million dollar cap hit. Like I, I kind of think it makes some sense, honestly. It's it's it'll be interesting to see if we see that that trend continue. Plus with uh, a quarterback who's been injured. Yeah. A starting quarterback who's you know had injuries issues. Yeah, protect yourself. Yeah, I think it makes sense. What do you yeah. think of Sam Howe? Uh, I'm higher on him than than many others. I I absolutely love him. I think the upside is huge. I liked him coming out in that draft. I couldn't believe he lasted until the fifth round. There were a lot of uh, there was a lot of thought at that time that he might appeal to the Seahawks. There were also some connections with Desmond Ritter in that draft. Oddly enough, um, I'm a Geno Smith guy. 
And I think if he has a big enough year this year, if he really meshes well with Ryan Grubb, there's an opportunity for an extension there. But anything less than that, I think, I, I will say this, I think John Schneider really likes John Howell, and I think he's underplaying, or Sam Howell, I think he's underplaying how much he likes him. I think they see him as a potential long-term starter moving forward. So can't wait to see how that plays out in the preseason yeah. because I, I think I think what <laughs> he was he was done no favors in Washington last year. No. You know, with an offensive coordinator who struggled to call a game and just they basically threw in the towel and they were throwing it 70% of the time right. with that offensive line, it, it just it made it real tough on him. And you saw that in the second half when teams started to adjust to that. So yeah. uh, I think he's a fun player. I think he's a baller. Yeah. Yeah. He's got guts. Uh, in fact, I'll throw a little Cardinal uh, reference at you. So he reminds me of a guy because I'm always a sucker for the Brett Favre types, the guys that are just sort of the, 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 you know, that I think the term gunslinger has become a derogatory term. I don't see it that way, but a guy who's willing to take some risks because he has that kind of confidence, yeah. sort of a backyard, it just, but he'll sacrifice his body. You know, we saw what Howell did his last year at North Carolina when all of his weapons graduated to the NFL and he ran for 900 yards right. and he wasn't, he wasn't sliding to avoid hits. He was lowering his shoulder and running some guys over. He reminds me of a guy whose name you're going to know who I went to college with, who was my roommate, who was a best man at my wedding many, many, many years ago in uh, Tim Rosenbaugh, who was a first round supplemental draft pick of the Cardinals way back when in 1991 and, and played that same way. Like yeah, he did. Had a linebacker mentality at the quarterback position. So I've always been drawn to that. And yeah. Howell, Howell has some Rosenbaugh qualities. Too. Oh, my God. I always love Rosenbaugh. Yeah. Always yeah. loved him. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a great, great analogy. Yeah. You know, a little bit shorter than Rosenbaugh, I think. Right. But yeah, I think, Tim, I think Tim was Tim was a legit six one pushing oh, really? six two. That's yeah. all. Okay. Yeah. Well, he was bigger in my eyes because I really he was thick. Him. Yeah, he was thick, and he he, he was right. much more athletic than he looked because he had a terrible body. Like he did, he was just naturally athletic. <laughs> he actually uh, returned kicks in high school. That's how I thought it. Like yeah. He was. But uh, yeah, fun little reference there. I'm glad I thought of that. Oh my God, me too! And I'm so <laughs> amazed that you you played it with him at Washington State. Well, I didn't. I didn't play. Yeah, but he was. Uh, yeah, we met because he right. was. He, your jersey, right? What's that? Isn't that your jersey back there? Yeah, but it's it's just I customized it just to show my loyalty to, to WSU. I, I thought about walking on and then I went to a couple of practices and decided I wanted to keep all my limbs. So yeah. that was the end of my football career there. Yeah. You knew you had a career in podcasting coming. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> you were protecting it. Let's finish up with this. We just got the big schedule released two days ago. And, you know, the Seahawks and the Cardinals essentially play the same slate of opponents. In fact, they're both tied for 24th in strength of schedule in the league at, at just under 49% win percentage of their opponents, which tends to happen with the way the schedule is built these days. But unlike how I feel about the Seahawks schedule, I look at the, the Cardinals schedule and they, <laughs> I don't know if somebody in the Cardinals organization pissed off the schedule makers with the NFL, but this is this is the first six out of the gate at Buffalo, right. then Rams, Lions, then right. you get the Commanders week four right. at Niners at Green Bay. Right. Like, what were your thoughts when you first saw that? Well, mixed because JJ Watt, right before the schedule came out, tweeted what every NFL player looks for when they first see the schedule. And he had five criteria. Um, one was first game. Yeah. So when I looked at first game at Buffalo, I said, good. Because even though the quality opponent, they did a lot of changing in Buffalo. Stephon Diggs isn't there anymore. They tr they got rid of their two great safeties. Um, so that's a bit of an unknown now, how well they're going to bounce back from some pretty serious personnel changes. And you're not going to Buffalo in December. Right. So I'm thinking, you know, um, ge geographically, it's a plus. And if you're going to play them, you have to play them. Might as well be week one when they're not sure yet. You know, it could be um, a good time to play them. So his second one was um, uh, how many distraction games do you have? Okay. You know, with schedule changes and yeah. you know, the answer to that was none. Types. Yeah. 
Yo, oh, the only one is a Monday night football gig at home, which is our only um, nationally tied, I mean, only primetime game, um, which I kind of like because we've played historically bad in, in primetime games. Hmm. So, and maybe this team will be the one to change it. And if they're doing well, they might get flexed later in the year. So that would be wonderful. But uh, also being on the East Coast, the primetime games uh, and being 69 years old, <laughs> it's tough uh, to be up at midnight at my age. But for the Cardinals, I'll do it. But um, so that was a checkbox. Um, but all the ones that I wrote an article on this on Revenge of the Birds, all the things that he pointed out as things you want to look for, um, weather games. The only one I could think of, everything everything was ideal except for maybe Carolina in December. Hmm. That's the closest I could come to. Like we have Miami in October. Good. You know, all those ones that could have been affected. Right. Um, yeah, you get Green Bay early enough. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Um, when did you get Green Bay? Uh, we're late in the year. Um, yeah. But it's, it, it's here. They- Oh, good. It's here, and it's one of our primetime games. It's a Sunday okay. night football game. It's here in, okay. I think, late November. Yeah. yeah. We got uh, a week six, so great. That's another one. I mean, Green Bay in late October, bingo. Ideal. So Yeah, December, December 15th. So, yeah, late in the year, but it's here. So Plus, they gave us three home games in a row. Um, right, yeah. At, three, at, three, yeah, you come home against Rams, Lions, Commanders, and uh, that's yeah. unusual. That's unusual. And then you finish. Now, if there's any chance that this team surprises and they've got some sort of shot at a wild card or in the division, you finish with the 49ers and Rams, which is interesting as well. Right. And the last one was the bye, which we improved by three weeks from week 14 last year, which was to week 11, which comes after two home games and then precedes two away games. Hmm. That's nice. That's not bad. I mean, that's kind of. If you were going to do it, I think that's that that's a plus too. So yeah, yeah the brutal early apart, but then we also have not as brutal. But you and I both know that um, all the time. Every time you look at a schedule now versus what's happening with a team when you get them, mm-hmm. two completely different things. Like and last year, everybody yeah. thought the Jets don't, don't play the Jets, right? Well. Four game, four plays into a game, that all changed when yeah. Aaron Rodgers went. So yeah. um, you never know. And that's why this year I'm not even with the new coaching staff, new schemes, a lot of unknowns. I'm not even doing a a schedule, pre, you know, a game by game record prediction this year like I usually do because it's fun and people like to see that. There's, there's no way to know. There's absolutely no way to know. Um, Seahawks are going to have to wait to see this version of the Cardinals team. Uh, th- this kind of happened to us last year with the 49ers. We don't see them until week 12, and then we turn right around and get you again in week 14. Right, right. Um, so that'll be certainly interesting. Uh, to, f- to finish off, you mentioned at the top that you like this Seahawks team. Uh, right. your, your outside view, uh, looking inward at Mike right. McDonald and his first season and all the things they've done in the offseason. Well, first of all, Mike McDonald, you know, um, did a fabulous job in Baltimore last year. Um, I think for your young defense, uh, he's going to do really good things. Love your defensive talent. I mean, I went to went and compared every position for Cardinals right now on paper, starting position versus yours. Hmm. I had on your defensive side of the ball. I had like you. You have an advantage at like eight of the 11 positions. So um, on the offense, it was a little different because I think our offensive line, and here's how I would, you know, I think a quarterback until Kyler can beat Geno, Geno's, would I give him the nod, hasn't beaten Geno yet. Um, at running back, um, it's close. But I'd probably give the, the nod to Connor because he – his PFF was 89.2 and Walker's was 82.8. Yeah, Connor seems, seems to be getting better with age. Oh, he is some kind of baller. But the thing with both of them is, can they still stay healthy? As yeah. you know, 
Yeah. With tight end McBride over Font. With wide receivers, you guys, I gave it to three out of the four. Um, and then uh, our offensive line I had, except for Cross, I had us favored. And that's where we have a chance against you if our offensive line can have it. And you, you sign the two young inside linebackers who had coming off pretty good years but unlimited snaps. Um, in uh, Tyrell Dodson, mm -hmm. who looks like a good up and coming player, and um, and Jerome Baker, those guys are going to be key for you in the middle of that defense. Yeah, you had trouble stopping the run last year. Oh. Although I think McDonald will have some answers to that. You've got some three really good players up front, in in uh, you know Leonard Williams, yeah. if he goes off this year, and then Jaron Reed's got to play better than what he did. Um, and uh, Draymond Jones, big kid, yeah. but was coming off sort of a, you know, but then your secondary can be lights out, uh, depending on your young safeties. Um, Love had a good year for you. Um, yeah. yeah, made the Pro Bowl. You know, he did. And, and uh, the Rayshon Jenkins, what's your take on him? Uh, everything that I know about him, because he, he was one of those players that, you know, there's name familiarity, but I haven't watched the Jacksonville Jaguars play a lot. I'm not intimately yeah. familiar with every, every player in the league, but you hear other guys talk about him who have covered him and, uh, that he's just a very solid, you know, brings his lunch pail to work every day, hard worker, does everything right. Doesn't have the elite upside. He's on the other side of 30 now, but it'll just be a nice steadying influence right. and a guy that can man the position and 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 be a solid safety for him, which right. you know, after moving on from Diggs and Adams, which was a necessary move, you know, I I think he was the right kind of guy to bring in. So yeah. well, I, you know, I'm I'm at the point right now where I'm just kind of deferring because of you know, Mike McDonald has built a resume that de demands respect. And so when they sign a guy like Terrell Dodson. Or right. John Baker and let Jordan Brooks walk. I'm okay. Mike McDonald knows linebackers. And so right. I'm assuming that he likes what he sees. When they draft a Tyrese Knight in the fourth round, which a lot of people thought was early, well, that was Mike McDonald's choice. You know, John right. Schneider said he kind of deferred to him on that and gave him that pick. So, right. and the same thing with the safeties in the in the secondary. So if if Mike McDonald is signing off on those moves, then until he proves otherwise, I'm I'm on board with it. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, if Cardinals are struggling at the trading deadline and it's clear they're not going to make the playoffs and they have an extended Buda Baker. Oh, don't get me started on that. All from Washington. <laughs> from Washington. Uh, there's, it doesn't take much for uh, Seattle fans when he kind of, when the, there was the min, little mini holdout or, or, or hint of a holdout, you know, last season there was a, you should have seen Seahawk Twitter. Just like, go get him, John. Go get him, John. Bring him home. Yeah, that's, uh, look, we just cleared a bunch of salary space from our our safety room to try to balance things out a little bit. I'm not quite ready to go add yeah. um, a top in the market and safety salary there yet. I never want to say goodbye to Buda Baker. Yeah. yeah. But he's, I'm mystified. He's the guy you want to keep. <laughs> I'm mystified as to why Jonathan Gannon came in with making Kyler the face of the franchise and not Buddha. I don't get that. And that's a concern me from day one. And Buddha's kind of up in the air right now because he's in the last year of his contract. Yeah. I mean, he's made six or seven pro bowls. I mean, the, the dude is a baller deluxe. He's, you know, the, the best alpha player we have. But for some reason, in, with Gannon, Buddha's kind of been, you know, silenced in a way. Um, he, you know, and I didn't like the way Gannon used him either. It wasn't as creative as you could be with a player of his magnitude. But, you know, um, so I, I'm praying that somehow that shifts and Buddha's back being a way well, he should be the face of this program. Um, he resembles, he's everything we want to be. And if that doesn't happen for his sake, they ought to trade him because he's too good. I mean, he's, and he's 
now in his prime and his best football is still ahead of him. And, uh, you know, I love that guy. He's unbelievable. Well, Buda Baker will forever live in Seahawk lore uh, as the guy that DK Metcalf chased down. Uh, <laughs> six down and one of the most you had to bring that up. Well, you had to unbelievable say. things you know, I think I've ever seen. I uh, think so. <laughs> I'll bet you Baker hears about that or or just thinks about it on a daily basis. Yeah. God, I can't believe I didn't score on that play. Do you have time for one question yourself? Yeah, go for it. Well, I want to know about your offensive coordinator because I'm so fascinated with him sticking around and what he did in Washington last year. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So what what do you think? I, I'm excited by it. I I of all the guys that were reportedly candidates, he was the guy that I wanted. I'm I'm obviously I got to see up close what he did here at the University of Washington. And and then you look back at his career arc and just kind of climbing up through the ranks and then linking up with DeBoer and what they did since. And the thing I like about him is he's proven to be a very adaptable play caller and adapting to the personnel on hand. And that's something going all the way back to Mike Holmgren's days that I've always had an issue with here that I don't think has been done well enough. I'm not a Shane Waldron fan. I, I gave him every benefit of the doubt. It'll be interesting to see how he does in Chicago now with all those weapons that they gave him there. But he's a guy that I just absolutely love listening to. And, and this is kind of what I say first when I talk about Ryan Grubb. I feel like every time I listen to him talk, I get smarter. I learn something. He has such a quiet confidence in how he talks. And he's what I like listening to experts in any field, talk about what they do, even if it's a field that doesn't interest me. And he he comes across to me as one of those guys. I think he has a, John Schneider's described him as a guy with a big brain. And I think I get that. And, and I'm excited to see because I think we've had the personnel on offense to be better than we've been. And I think he can get more out of the talent that we have on hand. Um, especially, you know, if the defense gets off the field a little bit more and, and things like that. So I'm excited to see it. I think he's one of those guys, too, that I wonder how long we're going to have to enjoy him because if he has success over the next two years, goodbye. Good, good chance he'll be in demand. So yeah. um, I, he doesn't strike me as a guy that that's his primary motivation, but obviously when those opportunities come up, you know, uh, most people tend to pursue them. So um, I'm excited to see what he can do, and, and I'm, I'm confident that he's going to get the most out of Geno Smith. I really do. I think that's a good match. I think if you were to comp, in fact, I saw this from a lot of other analysts and, and scouting services out there leading up to the draft, that if, you, if you're trying to find a pro comp for Michael Penix, in some ways it's Geno Smith. And yeah. what they do best is throw the football down the field. Yeah. And I think, I think Grubb, uh, I, think, I think that's a good match. And we'll see, we'll yeah. see that work. Yeah. yeah, he's got work to do, but... Uh, but I'm, I'm excited to see it. And, and I also just like, my final point is just, I like out-of-the-box decisions. I like the fact that, you know, Schneider was open-minded enough. And then once McDonald learned more about Grubb and really decided that's the guy he wanted, that right. they didn't just they didn't just lock themselves in that in that square of, ah, it's got to be, it's got to be a guy that's been a quarterback coach somewhere else, has NFL experience. I like the fact that they were willing to take a chance. Well, and the job he did, with Roma Dunze and Jalen Polk and yeah. McMillan. McMillan, I yeah. Mean, yeah. Oh my God. I mean, I fell so in love with Roma Dunze in the draft process. I think I, the guy that's going to benefit the most uh, from the changes, I think he's going to get uh, much more out of Jackson Smith and Jigba than, than Shane Waldron was able to do. I think so too. And that's the key for you in the, out of the spot. And, Plus, at, at Lockett's age, you ought to limit the times you want to send him over the middle. You know? yeah. I mean, he's so good otherwise on corner routes and drags and um, and, and uh, post corners and, and flies and goes and nine routes. But, you know, um, yeah, I'm living for the day that Tyler Lockett doesn't post 150 yards and two touchdowns. I guess. <laughs> Uh, it might not happen again this year. Who knows? But yeah. uh, with, with your guy Grubb on board, um, do you think you're going to be pass heavy? I, 
I think it, when you look at his his career, I, pass heavy is an interesting term. I think they're going to be. Boy, that's a, that's a good question. I think there's a lot of similarities in the way that Carroll wanted to run his offense when he was in Seattle, in that they they definitely want to establish a physical running game. Right. But I do think it'll be closer to what we're seeing kind of around the league and what we've seen here in Seattle over the last few years and closer to a you know 60% pass mix that I think they'll mix it up. I think they'll be they'll pass on early downs. It's just a matter of how effective they are with the running game. We saw that at UW. There were some games where you know Penix was going crazy and they they had some matchup advantages and they right. would just continue to go back to that matchup right. advantage what i loved about Penix and, and grub and they would just continue to hammer away at that until you showed you could stop it and right. and then there were games where it wasn't working i think at usc last year is a good example and they handed the ball to dylan johnson over 30 times right. and he just pounded the trojans and they won the game that way and so i right. think week in week out yeah. it's going to change depending on what they're doing well and who they're playing but right. overall I, th- I think they're going to throw the ball around the yard a lot yeah, well, you got the studs to do it, and uh, and you got guys out of the backfield who can. I mean, Walker is a screen pass waiting to be a thirty yard. I've seen it first our Cardinals. Um, well, let's hope. Don't get me started on screen passes. That has been a blind spot for the Seahawks for many, many years. Uh, yeah. That's one thing. That's one thing we're we're encouraged about up here. Is that that's something that Grubb has shown he can do, and 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 maybe especially with some of these. These uh, offensive linemen we've added this year a little bit more athletic can maybe get out there and, and right. lead the way that that maybe we can unlock that because I've I've been screaming that for the last two years too that they haven't used they haven't made enough of an effort to get Walker in space by getting the ball out to him quickly and I think he he and Charbonnet has, has shown he can do that well too he's he caught oh, a lot yeah. of balls, caught a lot of balls at UCLA too yeah. so yeah the two yeah. of them yeah uh, that's Walter Mitchell. Revenge of the Birds is the website. The Red Rain Podcast, right. one of the few, one of the few remaining SB Nation podcasts out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, good for you. Uh, great conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time. What do you? This is kind of a slow time of year for people to do what you and I do. What's your focus the next couple of months leading up to training camp on how you're going to cover the Cardinals? Um. Well, I have a dilemma going right now because. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just react openly and honestly uh, to what's happening. Like, I'm one of the few people who didn't like the Zay Jones hire, hmm. having drafted three wide receivers in the last two years. Let's go young and play young. I mean, I, I we are notorious for drafting a wide receiver or two in a draft and then signing a veteran who's going to take all the reps. Hmm. Yeah. I just don't. And who's at the tail end of his career, like AJ green was, or like the truth, uh, Robbie Anderson, or the chosen one. Oh yeah. Um, didn't do anything for us. Um, even Hopkins at the end was a nightmare. So, um, and meanwhile, guys are just sitting on the bench, like, you know, and so, but I have a dilemma now, Dan, because, Ever, there's the buzz for the Cardinals amongst the fans is just so rabid that some members are telling me, you know, back off, you know, let us enjoy the buzz. And um, I'm not kind of wired that way because I'm just going to be honest right. um, with my feelings. If I thought the Jay, Zay Jones t- trade was awesome, I'd be saying it. But I can't, you know, it's hard to just ride a buzz and have it you know attract readers like that's the weird thing about journalism is you write what people want to want to hear no one seems to respond to it you write something a little bit controversial or opinionated and suddenly woo you know so what's your advice on that i just you know you and i chatted about this briefly uh leading up to this that um I'm not a fan of the confrontational style of, of journalism and the way that's gone. I haven't watched anything uh, on ESPN or Fox outside of a live sporting event for years because I just don't like those shows. And they've they've all started doing that. Right. And that's that's now worked its way into print journalism and podcasting where, 
you have to try to, you know, you're trying to earn clicks to increase your revenue. And, and there's, there's a lot of really, really good content creators out there for every team. There are certainly many good ones in the Seahawk community, but there are those who also fish for, for salacious headlines and clickbait. And I chose early on, it's just not my style, first of all. Yeah. But I also, once I started to see my channel grow, I saw the way it was growing and the type of audience it was attracting. And it was by being true to myself and the approach I want to take, which leads to slower growth. But I've also noticed that my viewership is appreciative knowledgeable engaged they're consistent they support the channel that there aren't i have very very few trolls that i have to deal with and so right. give me slow growth for the right audience right. any day of the week over over more dollars because i'm growing it i'm growing right. it faster you know well just uh, one quick comment to that is that um i found being truthful gets mistaken for wanting to create clickbaits mm. or you get accused hard. of being negative yeah if you right. if you say anything critical right. Right. you know yeah. sometimes just being telling the truth now i've heard some people say i won't say anything negative about some of the cardinal sign because you can't come back from it if you do um but what i do is ask questions i probe and by asking questions sometimes it gets you you know, um, it goes a long way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want to leave it up to my readers too, but, um, and to the listeners, but it's hard because, you know, I'm a fan. I want to, you know, I want to give the fans what they want, but at the same time, it's really hard for me to like lie and, you know, put on a happy face when, when I'm not happy. Uh, right. Yeah. And the, the we have plenty of reasons not to be happy in the division <laughs> that we play in. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. We didn't even, you know, if it, I could, I could sit here, I could start asking you about your thoughts on the Rams and 49ers. We'd be here for another hour. Cause yeah, it's a, it's funny how, you know, not too long ago, it was considered the strongest division in football. And then it all kind of fell apart except for the 49ers. And now it looks like it's kind of trending back that way again. So, right. um, which is one of the reasons I really, really wanted to, have some opponent viewpoints on the show um, to give more of an in-depth look than I'm capable of doing myself because you're more uh, emotionally invested in it and and also with your time and effort. So thank you so much for coming on the show. On Twitter, you can check him out at WBJ Mitch. Walter, thanks for being here. Thank you, Dan. And I'd like to invite you to Red Rain. We'll do an F NFC West program and pick up the conversation there. We'll cover all four teams and get after it if you will accept. Absolutely. Anytime. Right. Let, me, let me know. We'll we'll work that out. And go Cougs. Ah, oh, see, that's a great way to end the show. Jalen Thompson, baby. That's right. I love the best supplemental pick ever. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> Tim Rosenbaugh was a good supplemental pick. Oh, oh my so we'll God. You got about it. Tim. We'll end on that oh, note. There you go. That's awesome. Thanks, Dan. All right. Thanks, Walter. All right. Take care. So we're two thirds done now with our off season look around the NFC West. Jake Ellenbogen will be joining me soon. We have been, I know I've been teasing it. We have been trying to get our schedules matched up. That will happen in the coming days. Uh, a lot of you and Rob Guerrero were on the show, thought he was a homer. And uh, uh, I love Rob's approach to what he does. Uh, Walter seemed a little more objective. How do you feel about it? his opinion of the Cardinals. How do you feel about what the Cardinals have done the last couple of years after the coaching change and the new GM and starting to build up that roster? Do they concern you at all? Are you seeing the Cardinals come up in your rear view mirror? What do you like or not like about what they're building there? What do you like or not like about what Walter had to say today about the Cardinals or the Seahawks as well? Coming up on the show, as I said, Jake Ellenbogen will be joining me soon to wrap up this series and take a deep look at the Rams. Also, Dana O'Gorman, the old, the ex, she's not old, my old partner on the Field Goals podcast and uh, many time uh, guest here on the show, good friend of the show. You've been asking for her. She'll be joining me Sunday morning with her thoughts on, she attended the draft. How did that go? And what are her thoughts on what's happening with the Seahawks right now? Until then, follow me on Twitter at Seahawks forever, forever and always go Hawks. Thank you so much for watching.